title for this session is What Are Our Goals? What is our strategy? Now, most of you should have already received in the summer one of these leadership manuals. Um, it, it may not have had this nice gold cover, but it would have been printed, which is different from duplicated editions of this manual that went out last year. We hope that you haven't already lost the manual. Uh, every one of these costs quite a little money to make or to put together, print. And we always seem to be running out of copies. But uh, if you don't have one, you can take one after this session up here. If you already have one but you forgot it, you can borrow one. But I really ask you to be faithful in returning it uh, and then getting your other manual, the one that you forgot. And in a sense, we consider this required reading for this conference if you haven't already read it. If you've already read it, well, it wouldn't harm you to reread especially some of the key chapters. In some ways, our lecture this morning is supplementary to the very last chapter in this manual called Ultimate Aims and goals. Um, the purpose of this conference, by the way, in some ways is threefold, or at least there's three types of persons uh, here. There are people who have been in leadership in OM, some of them for quite some time. In fact, even country coordinators and leaders in general are expected to be at this conference, unless they just can't possibly make it. Uh, this is really supplementary conference to our coordinators conference, which is only a three-day event. In fact, as coordinators, we will be meeting for lunch and already today digging in to some of the important issues that we have to decide and think about as a movement. So these people are with us. Then there are those of you who are very new to leadership in OM, but you're, you're in OM. You may or may not have a position of leadership this year. And then there are those of you who are guests. And we're very, very uh, happy that you've come. We especially want to welcome those of you who are not necessarily in OM or joining OM this year, but you've come as a guest because you've got a leadership responsibility and you're just hungry to learn. We're uh, flattered or complimented that you think you can learn something from the likes of us, and we hope you in fact do. Um, in talking about goals, one of our most important and practical goals is leadership training. And I never dreamed uh, in the very earliest years of the work how much God wanted to use us in this area of leadership training. I just received a letter from one of the leading really leading Christian leaders from the whole of Norway. He wrote a very humble letter, very clear letter, uh, the things that he learned just in a one-day leaders' conference on the ship. He put it right down in black and white. Uh, and the other benefits he got. One benefit, he listed, there were three things, actually, I can remember the letter. The first was the privilege of meeting Christians from other groups. In his own country, he had never been in a leader section, leadership conference with such a wide cross-section of different Christian leaders. Um, secondly, he was thankful for what he learned in the conference, especially in a session in which we talked about the mistakes that leaders make. And he's determined in his life, God's grace, not to make some of those mistakes. Thirdly, he said he was greatly benefited by the books he was able to get. We will be putting up a display of books, um, which I selected from the Bromley Bookshop just before coming here. And um, I know there's probably no one here that has seen every one of these books. We want to introduce you to new books. Um, you're not going to be able to just take these, by the way. You'll have to write down the title and then get one somehow or order it. We can maybe bring more over. But uh, there will be a massive literature display, of course, with many, many, many books. These are just a few new ones that I just gathered to introduce you to. So God has 
just given us such a, a privilege to be involved in, in training leaders. There are now about 600, five or 600 XOMers in almost every major mission of any size uh, in the world today that has any roots in the countries we work in. I can't speak for indigenous missions in the middle of the Congo, though uh, there are very, very few countries where there are not XOMers. The thrill has been to see these people moving into key positions of leadership. Um, Ten years ago, they were sitting here. Ten years ago, they were getting their first taste. Many of these people had their first taste of leadership in OM, a movement crazy enough to throw uh, the likes of some into leadership because we are not looking just for well-seasoned leaders. We're not sure they exist anymore. We're looking for those we can train in this task. We know that the lecture method that we're having right now is one of the weakest. And the living with people method and the living together and working together and suffering together and evangelizing together and solving problems together is the best method. So we don't spend so many weeks a year in this method. Uh, but we do believe it's important also to see uh, or to take extra time, because we're looking at the Word of God all year, we're learning all year, but it's good to take extra time to really look into these things and see uh, what the Bible says and to share with you, especially those of you who are new, what we really believe and to remind ourselves, those of us who have been around a longer time, you know, what we believe. Where are we going? Are we still going there? Have we been sidetracked? And uh, this is why I believe even a session like this morning in which we can talk about our goals and our strategy is worthwhile. This is a vast subject. This last chapter in your manual, we, we, we uh, call it ultimate aims and goals because we have many goals on a short-term basis. Don't we? One of my goals right now is uh, this conference. But that's not my ultimate goal. This conference is a means to the ultimate goal. So we always, in a sense, have two sets of goals. Don't we? we have our longer term goals, and then we have a goal, the goals of a week. I have some goals for this week. We have goals for today. I have a goal for the next half an hour. And personally, that goal for the next half an hour is quite important, isn't it? Because that's what I'm in right now. And I may have other little ideas, but I've got something I must do right now. So we want to try to narrow this subject down and talk about some of our more ultimate goals. Let me insert this very important statement, and I hope you will take notes and I hope you will study. It's interesting that the best set of notes that came to me last year was from the person who I thought really needed to take notes least. Uh, he already had two doctor's degrees, was more intelligent than the average person drifting in an OM, and yet produced the most clear set of notes, and eventually I got a, got a copy of them. So I hope you don't feel that you're too uh, intellectual or too beyond to take some notes, because also sometimes you want to teach these things to others, or you want to discuss them, and you can't remember what has been said. But we must understand, uh, and let me just insert this other little problem. I realize some of you are not in OM. Some of these things will not be as relevant. Some of the sessions in this conference will be more relevant to you. But we have got to uh, handle some things that are very, very basic to us as a movement. And it seems to me these things are so basic that some of them at least can be incorporated into your work, your Christian union, your local church situation, or wherever else it may be. What I was about to say is that these goals are worked out in different ways in different fields. Because of this, very few people, even within OM, seem to understand OM. I never cease to be amazed about this. 
If I asked people what is OM doing in Turkey, they w- many would not be able to give an intelligent answer. Because you will not learn about OM in Turkey through taking part OM France. Because they are two completely different operations. There is an enormous diversity within OM. In the early days, I had great trouble with two brothers in one area. Both of them are with Jesus now. John and Keith killed together, taken to be with the Lord together in the motor accident in Poland in 65 or 66. But I spent a lot of time with each one of these brothers uh, pointing out that what the other brother was doing was, was, was part of the vision. Uh, brother Keith couldn't really see where this literature thing uh, which it was called STL, was really part of the, you know, the real OM in gut thrust. He didn't use those terms, of course, they're mine. And uh, on the other hand, John, who came from an organizational background, he was an organization with the Phillips Corporation, he couldn't, you know, quite figure out, what, you know, the other aspect of OM, sometimes he had a little difficulty uh, uh, understanding certain parts of it. Well, from the very earliest days, both of these important aspects of OM were there, which you're going to get to in a minute. So, don't try to just understand OM as a whole. This is OM. Get some of the basic goals, which we're going to talk about, and then as you have time, try to get to understand the different aspects of OM. You see, it has been our belief from the beginning that the strategy for a particular country should be basically determined by the national leaders in that country. That, that concept was in OM before this manual was written. And that these nationals who should be setting the pace, they must determine how the basic goals will work out in their country in the midst of the particular problems that they are facing. The problems we face in India are completely distinct from the problems we face uh, in Great Britain or Sweden, or other countries. So I think that's very, very important. Let's get down to some of the basic goals. Uh, We've listed here in this chapter uh, some of the things that we don't want the movement to be. We don't want to be another mission board or denomination. Um, One of the reasons is because there already are many of those. Some people do not understand the difference between a mission board and a movement like OM. There are many differences. If I get into that, I'll never get through. This is my greatest problem speaking. I get sidetracked all over the place. But there is a great difference between the way OM operates and a standard mission board. You should be able to understand that. Just in terms of how candidates are accepted. A mission board is a board of men who sit down and decide who is going to go and who doesn't go. And um, it doesn't quite happen that way. We don't even know who's here. But um, we can't get go into that too much. We don't want to be a mere opportunity for Christian service, point two. We don't want to be just a literature distribution agency. Though, of course, we distribute literature. We'll be seeing some of that lately. Some of you are already in that seminar or workshop. We don't want to be another institution. And we don't want to be a band of Pharisees. When you reject the first four, you'll easily go into point five if you're not careful. It's so easy somehow for religious people to feel that they are one up on others. Maybe because they have special light or special feelings, or they, 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 they see God work through them in special ways. Well, maybe if they took more time, they'd see God working through others as well, because he is. Then we've listed some of the aims, the things that we want to be. Number one, a fellowship of like-minded believers. OM, I believe, is a movement with the emphasis on relationships. 
This is absolutely the core of what has been happening in this work from the beginning. God has been building relationships between people. Ultimately, I don't feel you can really be loyal to an organization. I believe eventually that collapses. Ultimately, I don't even believe you can be loyal to a set of doctrines. A lot of Christian work has been built on those two things. Building up loyalty to an organization, our organization, our church, or to doctrine, our doctrine, we've got the truth. This is our doctrinal statement. Many groups make you sign a doctrinal statement. And people who have never seen each other have a loyalty because they've signed a doctrinal statement together. And they say, boy, isn't this wonderful? We all believe the same here. We all believe the same thing about the premillennial uh, theory. And there are groups that you cannot join without signing a statement that you believe in a premillennial theory or a post or pre-tribulation theory. Now, I'm not saying God can never work through a movement that has builds on this kind of loyalty. But it is my own view that eventually this collapses. I believe that, of course, should be part of real Christian unity. Doctrine must be part of our loyalty. Absolutely. There needs to be a certain degree of loyalty to, to, to our local church. Absolutely. But the deeper, the deeper loyalty is to one another as believers. And so extra effort must be given to building up relationships. Now, this is slower. In many Christian situations, people join a Christian organization just like employment. You go to the employment section, you see the personnel director, he interviews you, you go through certain things, you decide on a salary, and you join. Again, I'm not saying God doesn't use that. But we've seen right around the world that one year later, someone comes along with a better salary, and so you leave that group hardly without batting an eye, and you go join the other group for a better salary. This is happening all the time. It is our conviction that one of our greatest aims in this movement is to build relationships. Now, there are two kinds of relationships that I see, practically speaking. One, we build relationships that are linked with the work we are doing. We've got to face facts that we have a job to do. It's great to be theoretical, talk way up here. We have a job to do, don't we? God has called us to a work to do. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. So some of our relationships are organizational centered in the sense that we are working in the same organization. And these relationships have to hold absolutely essential for the ongoing power and uh, reality in that movement. But just as important are relationships that are outside the movement. They have nothing to do with OM. And I believe they will be, for some of us, our more important relationships, or just as important. It'll be harder to maintain those. Those of us who work together in OM, we are, we have, to some degree, we're forced to stay right with one another. Boy, I tell you, if we don't stay right with one another as leaders, we're going to have trouble. But there's no compulsion on me uh, to, to, to keep a, a strong relationship with someone outside of OM other than the love of Jesus Christ. That should be enough. And so, a person who's in OM is building relationships within the work, getting linked in heart and mind and soul to, to move together in evangelism, church planting, literature. We're going to talk about that. But also, he's building up relationships outside the work. Not because he expects that person is going to catch fire and join OM. Some of my very good relationships are with people that I, I don't think they should join OM. I think they ought to continue doing what they're doing. And I think this is very, very important. A mark of sectarianism is when all our deep relationships are with people who are only within our little clan or clique or spiritual movement, whatever little label you want to put on it. 
I think this is very important. So, we've talked about OM being a fellowship of like-minded believers. I might just say that people who are outside of OM, at least the structure of it, of course are the people that are really carrying this movement forward. In a sense, they are not outside. We could argue all day, are the prayer partners outside or inside? To me, the prayer partners are the foundation. People come on OM and they leave us in the end of the summer we never hear from them again. Prayer partners have stood with us for 18 years. And our relationship with these prayer partners is should be as meaningful as some of the people who are right with us. But I think we must realize that we must have good relationships with people who may not even want to be prayer partners. I think that also is included in what I was referring to before. A fellowship of like-minded believers. Of course, I've gone on to say more here. Who for the sake of training, spiritual growth, fellowship, prayer, and spiritual warfare, unite at certain times for special all-out efforts with the goal of reaching the entire world with the gospel. For this reason, most young people are encouraged to unite with us for a summer or year-long campaign before continuing on with the main line of ministry to which God has called them. And right there we can underline the words. If you have your manual, you can do it. Efforts with the goal of reaching the entire world with the gospel. There is one of the cardinal, main, foundational, use whatever word you want, goals of the movement. It's quite simple, isn't it? In direct obedience to the Great Commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Lord gave the command. His command becomes our goal. And our goal as a movement is to fulfill that commission. It's to reach the entire world with the gospel under point one in this ultimate aim and goal. Um, of course, that's very general. But you've got to have your general, basic, long-term goal before you can have the smaller goals to reach that. I think it's very important. Now, the moment I say that, I include in reaching this goal all believers. I think it's wrong to say our goal in OM is to reach the whole world with the gospel. But we as OM are not going to do that. That is the goal of the whole church. The goal of the whole church. And so we in OM must find our place within the church. I have people come to me and say, Boy, when are we going to go into this country? OM's not in this country yet. It is not our goal to go in every country. Because we are part of the body of Christ. We believe it is the goal of the whole church to go into every country. So, we get our goal, which is very basic and very ultimate, and then we've got to find our place. I think the second is harder than the first. I think it's pretty basic, though I think some people lose the basics, myself, that we reach the whole world. But what is our place? And this leads us to one of our very specific basic goals, which is right here in the same paragraph, to be a fellowship of like-minded believers who, for the sake of training spiritual growth, we are unquestionably a training program. Now, when you say that, immediately some people think, well, that's all we do. We train people. So some people, the only thing they think OM does is take people very young, very untrained, on a summer crusade or a year program, and they train them, and then they send them on. And then they can't understand what we're doing in Turkey. They can't understand a man who's been laboring 10 years with SPL in London. They can't figure out uh, what Captain Paget is doing on the ship at 64 years of age. It's hardly the time to begin training, though, you know, Never too late to learn. So, because our emphasis is training, and this is certainly one of our main methods of reaching that final goal, that doesn't mean that's all we do. It doesn't even mean that for some of us, that is our main thing, because different leaders in OM have different burdens. And different leaders have a, a greater burden as to how people can be trained. So training people and 
enabling them, helping them in every way possible to grow spiritually. And I love to think of OM as a movement aimed at spiritual growth on every level. Individuals, local church, university groups. We want to see Christians grow. I like to think of OM as a movement of spiritual renewal. We want to see renewal in the church of Jesus Christ. We want to see it in individuals. I think that's very, very important. The moment we talk about training, we have all kinds of ideas. Many people have a very stereotyped view of training. They believe training would basically only take place in a Bible school. You go to Bible school to be trained. Uh, I, 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 I praise God for the Bible school movement. I don't see how anyone cannot praise God for the Bible school movement and how the Lord has used it. But I am convinced that the local church should be the foundation uh, method in God's program for training believers. That believers should be trained in their local assembly and church and it should start when they're about four years of age or five. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't put a, a date on it. And you and I know that this is the area where many, many churches find a great amount of difficulty. And this is why it is often churches that ask OM to come in and help them with a training program, with a leadership program. I find many people very naive about the state of the church. We seem to go from extremes, people who reject the church and the church is all dead, to people who become church neurotics. They can't see anything outside the little local church structure. And if you nail them down, it's usually their church. And seems to me there's a happy balance. We see in the book of Acts the importance and the significance of the local church. Therefore, any true goal within OM must include the local church. This is why in some of our fields, the main goal in, in the context of the training program is to see local churches planted. It fits together. They want to train people. They want to plant churches. They want to evangelize the world. It fits together. As we train people, work with people, they can be used of God to either help local churches or even plant new local churches. And together, together they will reach out to evangelize the world and the multiplication method will be functioning. Therefore, I do not see a confliction between training and evangelism and church planting. They are one. But what is important is that every country and situation we go into is different. And in some countries, OM is not involved directly in planting the churches. We're more involved indirectly. In India, we have not been involved very much in direct church planting. But we have been involved in training men who are going in to church planting. And this is important in a movement that is international and interdenominational because it is not our burden to transplant Western churches into the East. We believe these people have to, in a sense, plant and begin their own churches. It's absolutely exciting to see where XOMers are working in these days. The most exciting part of OM are the XOMers. Never forget it. It is not this little band of people that manage to hang together by the sheer mercy of God and keep it all going year after year. It's the XOMers. And they may not get into all the weekly reports and uh, they may not be in all the big conferences, but they're on doing the job all over the world. And some of them may not even agree with some of the things that, that we, or often at least they think we, we feel or believe. There are now 20 some plus thousand XOMers. We know some of them have more vision than others. That same is true of people in the work. Some are more disciplined than others. It's also true of us. Some have got on tangents. Nobody in OM, OM on a tangent. And so I believe 
even though it's never as fast as we want and there are many discouraging factors, I believe we are seeing these basic goals fulfilled of seeing the world evangelize, of being involved in training people to do this, which also means church planting, working with the church, sometimes bringing renewal to already existing churches, sometimes planting a church where no church has ever existed. Sometimes in regard to that, all we do is, is the very beginnings. We drop the acorns. Somebody else comes along and does the rest. There is no pretense in OM that we can do the whole job. The church, all believers together, are the only ones that can do the whole job. This includes tremendous movements like the Whitcliffe Bible Translators. This includes great student movements like Campus Crusade and InterVarsity. This includes uh, child evangelism fellowship, gospel recordings, tremendous literature agencies like Moody Literature Mission and Life Messengers. It includes uh, these great radio ministries around the world. We are all together in the same thrust forward. We all have the same goal of evangelizing the world. And then we have the job of finding out where we fit in. And I think the, the, the most unique part where OM should be fitting into this whole total picture, which we're all a part of as believers, sometimes whether we like it or not, is training, training young people, motivating them. With some, we'll have the privilege of training in three or four years. If we really want to give a man a training program, we need him for several years. But God has many ways to work. God has many training programs. And so, for some, they'll only be with us a month. But I have seen people pick up the OM vision in one month and blaze on a trail more than another brother who stayed with us for three years. Because, let's face it, different people have different potential. And different people absorb things at a quicker rate. I remember a young man. He's never been on OM. The only conference he ever came to the history of the work was one of these leaders' conferences. And in the last meeting, he recommitted his life to Jesus Christ, and he has never been the same again. He is a burning evangelist for God and the leader of another spiritual movement that is moving forward, reaching tens of thousands of people for Jesus Christ. That dear brother absorbed more of what's on my heart in three days than some people I've been with for five years. Because perhaps he had a greater gift to absorb and to put into practice. Than, than someone else. God is working in different people in different ways and I think that's very important when we think of our total goals. So training is key. Planting churches and seeing renewal within the church of Jesus Christ is key which very much involves us in leadership training because the church is not going to go any further than her leadership. Very, very important. And yet in the process of doing this, two things come to mind. One is that spiritually, I believe our highest goal is none of these things, and we'll probably have a whole message on this. I believe our highest goal is to know God. And I believe our highest goal is to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And if people put me on the spot and say, what do you think is more important? evangelism or spiritual development, I will say spiritual development. Because to me, you can be in evangelism without spiritual development. I have seen it. People who get caught up, evangelism is their thing. But you can't have spiritual development without evangelism. I wonder if you got that. You can have evangelism without spiritual development, spiritual growth. Uh, whatever term you want to use. But you can't have spiritual growth and development without evangelism. So to me, if, if, if someone wants to pin me down, I will say our greatest burden is to see young people or anyone growing in Jesus Christ. And to me, when a man is growing in Christ, he's becoming more like Christ. In one sense, I don't care if he joins a ship or OM or goes back and starts a bonfire in his local church. Or, 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 or joins 
uh, InterVarsity or some other group. And praise God for so many key brothers who were with us for several years who are now pastors of churches or leaders of missions out on the field. And this is exciting. And I think we should constantly be reminded of that. So our basic goal is to evangelize the world, though more important than that, it's to know God, it's to walk with God, it's to grow and become more like Jesus Christ. And um, I believe evangelizing the world and outreach should be the, uh, the spontaneous outflow of a life that's planted in God. In, in one sense, I'm an enemy of that which I actually organize. I organize crusades and special campaigns, summer campaigns and all the rest. So do you. And yet, in other ways, I'm an arch enemy of this. I fully understand, or at least I think I understand at times, people who think this kind of thing is all wet. I always like to ask them what they're doing about the situation. Get some interesting answers. You say, boy, you really are confusing me. Let me try to explain. If OM becomes project-oriented, summer crusade-oriented, campaign-oriented, we make a great mistake. Because we get to think that evangelism is when we have special campaigns. The disciplined life and evangelizing others is when I join OM for the summer. It's not when I get back to my office or back home. It doesn't really work back there. We don't say that, but we prove it. And I believe that, that, that this is a, a plague. I don't know how to stop it. Billy Graham comes to London and all of London starts moving in evangelism. Counseling sessions, prayer meetings. It's a fantastic thing. Billy Graham goes one year later. Now, praise God, some are still going on one year later. And that makes it all worthwhile. And one of the values of his campaigns, I think one of the biggest, is all the people he trains as counselors. I think that counselor training, which I had the opportunity of getting in on a little bit years ago, I was about two years old in Christ, is one of the most valuable things they do. Because Billy goes... But he leaves maybe 500 people have at least learned on a beginning level how to lead someone to Jesus Christ. And sometimes you'll go to places where they're very critical of Billy Graham and they've got all kinds of high sounding ideas. And you ask him, how many people in your church, brother, know how to lead anyone to Jesus Christ? And their mouth drops about six inches because they know they don't have any soul winners in the whole church. Even the pastor has doubts if he knows how to lead anybody to Christ anymore. And it grieves my heart when I hear the criticism against Campus Crusade for Christ. Anybody can criticize any human movement. You don't need any brains. And we'll put you up on the pedestal and we'll tear you apart as well. We're all weak. But there's no movement in our generation that has led more people to Jesus Christ that I know of than Campus Crusade for Christ. And I can sit down with you and list what I feel are some of their weak points, some things that even make me jump out of my shoes. I can do that also a little bit about OM. But our God is very big and very great. And if he could not use movements, despite their weaknesses and errors and tangents and even inconsistencies and even sin, then I don't think he'd have much left to work with. I don't think there'd be any local churches left. And I don't think there'd be many movements. And as we think of these tremendous goals and as we develop strong convictions within ourselves, how we're going to reach the goal Let's not judge others who are going about it in a different way. Let's not judge others who uh, uh, have their inconsistencies. What happens in the Christian church that's tearing us apart so much? We see their inconsistencies and they see ours. One man sees the holes in your sanctification theories and you see the holes in his sanctification theories and you both proceed forward in an unsanctified way to criticize and judge one another. Isn't that lovely? And it, 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 it's hard at times to face reality, but I think we've got to do it. And I believe one of our greatest goals in OM, this is what I'm building up to, is to be a blessing to the church of Jesus Christ. And to every group and to every movement. You say, that's too much. <laughs> well, look, there's quite a few of us. 
We're involved in 50 nations, about 25 long-term basis, about uh, another 25 and more of the ship going all over. I believe God wants to use this feeble word to just bless people all over the world. Teaching, training, encouragement, counseling, wherever we can fit in. This is why I believe that for to, to, to launch out into the mission field today with little stereotyped ideas of exactly how we're going to do it. You know, we arrive as foreigners in your country. We got our little package plan. I got this in my conference in Belgium. Let's see. It's in my pocket here. And we, we take out our little, our little plan. This is actually the washcloth from the airline. I save these. And uh, we, we've got our little strategy for your country. Well, that's, that's about as useful as this. Not much. We've got to go to these countries. We've got to humble ourselves. In most cases, we've got to learn the language. Before we do that, we, we mainly have to work as servants, as trainees. We mainly should think of ourselves on an encounter or, or uh, exposure program. We can help. We can be a blessing. But we can't really lead. We can't really do the kind of work that must be done more than anything else in that country. But together with the local people, the national people who know the language, so much can be done. But this demands a high degree of humility that I do not think is yet being produced among missionaries and even OM the way it should be. And this means, of course, that we're going to have to be flexible. And that the work in India is going to be different from the work in, 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 in Belgium. Think of our work in Bangladesh. Some of our OMers don't even think we're in Bangladesh. That, that shows how good our publicity is. OM technically is not in Bangladesh. But in fact, Bangladesh is one of our main fields in Asia. We have 20 full-time men. We even have another established mission organization that sponsors people to work, foreigners to work in Bangladesh. And in Bangladesh we're called young Christian workers. Who do you think is financing that if you want to know if it's part of OM or not? Who do you think is pouring all the money into it? Operation Mobilization. So the name is not important. The outward little structure is not so important, though sometimes necessary. But the fulfilling of the goals and the work in Bangladesh is different. The work in Nepal is completely different. Before I even knew it, uh, I think Steve Hart can tell me whether we closed our Nepal account. Did we close the Nepal account? Yeah. I didn't even know it. I didn't give my permission and I think it should be reopened because in my mind, Nepal without question is a key OM field and will continue to be so. The fact that the EBE structure is gone, I had actually been praying secretly for five years that that thing would go. Because though I saw the benefit of it, and I, I believed in it, I, I, I started it, I guess I should believe a little bit in it, I wasn't sure, is this really what God wants us to do here? Because a lot of the effort has to go into secular books. I have about as much interest in selling secular books in Nepal, you know, as I do swinging on these uh, lights. But this is the way we got our visas. This is the way we stayed in the country. This also brought people, brought contacts, though many years that was never working the way it should. And now the work in Nepal is going to have to take on a different, a different road. It may have to be based in India. It may have to be all Indians. Indians don't need visas for Nepal. Many Indians are Nepali background. They speak the language. Uh, because there is a feeling among many, you know, and that uh, track distribution really is superficial and... Uh, it's, it's not really the way to evangelize the world. We, we need to get down to church planting and, and the serious discipling of men. Well, all that's true, but why do you have to put that up against tract distribution? Don't you want to teach your disciples how to give out tracts? And I believe that tract distribution, mass literature distribution, is important. Some of you will be going to the seminar on that in the afternoon. So literature, all kinds of literature, fits right into the heart of the main goal. And some of you could make a study on all the different ways that literature touches every other part of the world. It's fantastic. And that's why we have things like STL. STL has other goals. 
So does the publishing program in France. So does Case's very dynamic literature program here in Belgium. So does the incredibly huge program in Bombay, where we're involved in over 200 projects right now. It has other purposes. Admittedly, we, we think it's good to, to do a little tent making. And uh, we feel in the work in India that, uh, that rather than just give people foreign money to evangelize their country, that it's better to help supply books. And our work in India has become very, very much, much more indigenous than people know. And uh, though foreign money is helping, because there are foreigners there, most of our Indians can say before the Lord that they are living off their own book sales and the gifts that they themselves see come in. Some of them come in general from Indians. From Indians. This has been very, very important in the building up of a work in India which now has 200 people uh, involved in it. So we believe literature fits in everywhere. We never want to become top-heavy so that we are just mainly a literature distribution movement, though it fits in. Where does the ship fit in? Certainly the ship doesn't go around uh, planting churches. To plant a church, as we've seen in France, team often stays two years. A ship stays three weeks. Where does this fit in? There are two, well, this is a, we're running out of time, but I think you can see that in training people, sometimes you have the privilege of spending hours, weeks, months, years with that person. That's great. But other times, your role will, will be that of a catalyst. You will provide the inspiration. You'll provide the, 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 uh, the starting point. And with the ship, both are going on. The people on the ship are all, at least most of them, in training. And what a training program this is. To me, it is certainly one of the best that we have. Uh, so they are in training. Those who come and work as volunteers, who stay on the ship for three weeks, that is a pretty intensive time of training. And we're seeing great results from them staying behind in their own port. I could talk a long time on that. But those who only come one day, our ministry must be inspiration, motivation, catalysts. I could give you the basic principles of this movement in one hour. Some of you have heard the seven emphases of OM. And I could give that to you in one hour. I want to tell you, it would take you many years to go out and put that one hour message into practice. And I have seen people, and this is why I'm so excited about this crazy little ship. I have seen people come and sit for one hour and go away and do more than people who have sat in these conferences for three weeks. I want to give you your three weeks, but I want to give these potential disciples all over the world who are just sitting, just sitting, it's like petrol waiting for a match. I want to give these people these principles, these messages, these books, and then watch them run. And if you don't believe the Holy Spirit knows how to organize, obviously you haven't been around too long. Because when we sail away from a port, sometimes more happens than when we're there. Because it only takes a spark to get a fire going. I believe in both ministries. Both are within OM. The kind of ministry in which we give long-term training, church planting, staying in an area for years. Many countries we've been in, we started 15 years ago, we're still there. We believe in that. Ankara, Istanbul, Tehran, uh, Amman, wherever else. But we also believe that whenever possible, we need to take a church meeting and see if a fire will get going. We need to send a book to a brother and see if a fire will get going. We need to visit a port for a month and see if a fire will get going. And the result, I believe, and we've seen it, new churches, renewed churches, whole new organizations, local evangelistic teams, and it's exciting. Well, I hope this gives you a little glimpse of what's burning on many of our hearts you can read the remaining part of the outline of this little lecture in this chapter in the manual, Ultimate Aims and Goals. There will also be opportunity in the further session to ask some questions. And we hope you will. We hope you will think these things through. One of the purposes of this conference is that each country and each field has to think these things through and see the direction that they must move in. The ship is going to be moving in one direction. The Arab world is going to be moving in another direction. 
Brother Jerry Davies with us of STL. They're going to move in another direction. When we look at it through our human eyes, the Arab world, France, the ship, STL, man, what's going on here? But I think when we look through it with these principles we've talked about in mind this morning, we'll see how it's all moving in the same direction. Spiritual development, world evangelization. Every possible method to see that take place, different in each country, depending greatly on the leaders of that country, on their communion with God, who must remain through the Holy Spirit the leader of this work. I am determining less than ever what happens in operation mobilization in the individual countries. Though I don't feel any less involved, I feel just as much involved because I've got a relationship with those brothers and as they go out to their country, I trust them. And I believe basically they're going to get the mind of the Lord. And as I can trust them and they can trust me, we can move together. I can work for them back getting recruits, finance, whatever else I can get my hands on and they can get on with a job in their country as they see it should be done. There may be some countries where they don't even need any longer the OM family, the international family. We're all God's family. That's the family I want to emphasize. As, as we saw in Spain and Italy, and so, and, and in Switzerland. And what, what's happening through new life in Switzerland? That's another story. And, and Proclama in Sweden. There'll be some sectors of this vision that won't any longer need the, the technicalities of the OM International. And they'll spin off and move on as Middle East media will or it's been the process of doing, and other parts within OM. We've got more little sons and daughters around the world than we can count anymore. Others, however, will see that belonging to the international fellowship and being in subject to this fellowship is vital for the particular job in their country. And so different ones will be led different ways. Let's pray together. Living God, we thank you for the fact that you've given us some goals. We thank you that we know where we're going. We thank you for being involved with other groups and movements and with the local church. We thank you for what happens in the longer term programs where some labor for years as our brother Dennis in Ankara among the same few. We thank you for what's done in some of the shorter term efforts. The catalyst bomb that explodes, the motivation that takes place in people's hearts that never stops until churches are planted and people are one to you. Oh, God, we thank you that you've put us in something that is moving. We thank you that you've put us in something that's got some heat. And we pray that none of us may be found lukewarm in these days as we move forward to attack the enemy on every front. We know that he will counterattack. We know that he will attempt the old enemy with all of his deceptiveness to bring disunity and confusion, to bring lack of vision, and to hinder us in every possible way. But, Lord, we will stand together. Build our relationships together in these days. Enable us to have love that covers a multitude of sins. Give us forgiveness that goes from the top of our heads to the bottom of our toes toward one another, both within and without the work. Give us deeper relationships with our local churches that we may impart vision and that they may impart to us that which they have from you. That together we may go forward. Deliver us from any subtle criticism, from evangelical snobbery. Deliver us from any kind of cynicism or spiritual pride or pharisaical attitude, that we may walk humbly before you in the power and the energy of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for this because without it, we will only be sounding brass and tingling cymbal. Without it, we will have a set of offices from coast to coast, but little reality and little power. We look to you now and we praise you and we believe that you're going to give us precious times of fellowship together around the meal and in the prayer meetings. 